been like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Or because of these surpass, sur, surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So encouraging. Thank you, Donna. Lily, I'm going to invite you to to sing. And just so you know, the lyrics, if you want to sing with Lily, um, will be up in the chat. If you wouldn't mind putting your microphone on mute. So God, you wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing can keep us apart.
Thank you, Lily. I'm going to invite Lulu. Lulu, are you there? You're going to read Psalm 18 for us. Uh, this reading is from Psalm chapter 18. He said, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my solid rock, my fort fortress, my rescuer. My God is my rock. I take refuge in him. He is my shield, my salvation strength, my place of safety. Because he is praiseworthy, I cry out to the Lord, and I was saved from my enemies. Thanks, Lulu. Lily's going to sing The Solid Rock. Thanks, Lily Bella. Thanks, Adam. Tammy? Hi, everyone. We're doing a reading from Galatians. Uh, Galatians. Oh, I can't even tell what it is. We're going to read. Three. Three. Thank you. <laughs> Three, seven. <laughs> Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel to be 
announce the gospel in advance of Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Thanks, Tammy. No longer slaves to the law. Uh, Duck and Matthew, why don't we sing about that? Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name i've been born again into a family your love throws through my veins i'm no longer a slave to fear child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God God 
You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I am. A child of God I'm no longer a slave fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I am a child of God I am a child of God That is the best possible news. No longer a slave to fear. We are children of God. Thank you so much, guys. That was awesome. Hi, Ryan. It's good to see you. I'm going to ask you to do a reading from 2 Timothy, but I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, Ryan. When you're finished doing the reading, would you mind saying a little prayer for our Pastor Pete that he can uh, speak the truth in love to us this evening? I'd love to do that. Thanks, man. Quick question. Do you want me to share my screen? Because I've got the reading up on it, so everybody might be able to see it bigger. Oh, I think that that's above my pay grade. <laughs> Adam, thoughts? If you can do it, do it. But if you can't yeah. do it, it's in the chat. Right, and it's that in was, the chat already. Yeah. That was my answer. No one else fed me that answer. Okay. So let's see if this works. Okay. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay. I'll just read it just to be safe. Okay. So this is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, 
we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Let's just take a moment and pray for Peter. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you have laid a message in the heart of Peter, and we pray that as he speaks today, the words will be yours, and the message will be yours. And Father, we pray that we will be open to the Spirit, that he will move through us, that we will hear, we will learn, and we will live what we hear. In that way, Father, we pray that you will be glorified in everything. And we pray this in the most precious name of the one who gave himself for us, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan, very much indeed. Thank you for praying for you. Thank you for that reading. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Good evening. And happy Victoria Day weekend, which probably feels like every other weekend, doesn't it, for the last few months? But anyway, we're here together and we've come to listen to God's Word. We're continuing our sermon series, Living the Abundant Life. Today's topic is Making a Life of Disciples. I hope some of you were able to download some sermon notes uh, through all that's been going on. If you recall, Paul is in prison in Rome. He's about to be executed because of his faith in Jesus and his faithful proclamation of the gospel. Timothy is his friend and his disciple. Timothy is a leader in the church in Ephesus, where there have been some serious problems, not least of which was the desertion of many from Jesus and the gospel. So in this letter, Paul is encouraging Timothy during this difficult time. That's why he says in verse 1, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Effectively, Paul was saying to Timothy, never mind what other people may be thinking, saying, or doing, and never mind how weak and shy you may feel, Timothy, you've you got to be strong. That's what we need. Now, if Paul's encouragement had stopped there, it would have been futile. Actually, I think it would have been absurd. He might as well have told a snail to be quick or to bring it into an understanding we have here. It'd be like telling the Leafs to win the Stanley Cup. As command a man as tim- timid as Timothy to be strong. Was that below the belt there for some of you? Sorry about that. But Paul's call to fortitude is actually a Christian call. It's not what we would call a stoical call. A stoical call would be to expect timid Timothy to be strong in himself, somehow to find it in himself, to sort of set that jaw like a a great Hollywood actor and grit his teeth and attempt to, to lead in his own strength, to drive it through. But Paul had discovered for himself, and the reading we had at the top of the service was so apposite, thank you Adam for choosing it, that God's grace was more than sufficient to help him in every difficult circumstance. And Paul was encouraging Timothy to find his resources for ministry in the limitless grace of Jesus Christ. So first of all, serve Timothy Jesus, of course, but do it in all sufficient grace. Second Timothy, you've got to share the gospel and you've got to make disciples. So chapter one, Paul was challenging Timothy to guard this gospel, to make sure it stays true and it isn't unchanged. But now we discover in verse two of our passage that Timothy has to do more than just simply preserve the truth. He's actually got to pass it on to the next generation and pass it on intact, unchanged. And so Paul here sets out a central principle of leadership in the church, which the church ignores at its peril, even maybe especially when we find ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic. So what is this central principle? What is the driving force of the church? Well, no Christian generation dare care only for its own health and growth. We're actually commanded to make provision for the generations which will follow. It's been well said the church is always one generation away from extinction. How do we do this? Well, verse 2 actually shows us that first the gospel was entrusted to Paul by Christ. So we remind ourselves again, this is Jesus' gospel. It's not made up by any human being. It's vitally important that we get the gospel only from the word of God. 
not from the ideas and philosophies of people, no matter how learned and well-meaning they might be. So, so we don't test modern teachers by their popularity or their charisma, by their education or their skill, or indeed by the number of followers and likes they have. We test them by the word of God and, and by the doctrines of grace and truth. If they match those, we say, great, we're going to listen to what you have to say. If they don't, then we say, well, we love you, but no thanks. Second, Paul, in turn, entrusted this gospel that Jesus had given to him, to Timothy. And he did this in the presence of many witnesses during the 16 years they ministered together. This meant that Timothy's teaching could be verified against that of Paul's. People knew and they would say, well, Timothy, you're not saying what Paul taught you. It also shows that the gospel is not a secret for the select few. Third, Timothy was now to entrust this gospel to reliable. That means faithful people of whom there are thankfully some left in Asia. And then fourth, those reliable people must be able to teach and train others. The gospel cannot stop with them. They must be able to faithfully pass it on. So it's Jesus to Paul, Paul to Timothy, Timothy to his reliable people, those reliable people to others, and so on, down through the centuries. And Paul, Timothy, and their successors did their job really well because we're all proof of it. We're here. And we're here today because of an unbroken chain of reliable, faithful witnesses. And that makes us stewards of the spiritual treasure Jesus has given to us through them. It's now our responsibility to guard the gospel. It's now our turn to invest in the lives of reliable people who will be able to reach and to teach the next generations. Now, as an aside, and many, many of you will know, occasionally I, I, I talk about a particular beef that I've got. This is one of mine, I freely admit it. It seems to me that the common Western method of sending people away to college to attend lectures is an utterly useless way of training Christian workers. I mean, think about it. No one would train hockey players by making them listen to lectures. The coach takes them out onto the ice to show them what to do. Training Christian ministers, indeed all Christians, is much more like training hockey players than mathematicians. The training is primarily practical, not theoretical. Jesus told us that our great commission is to make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28. It's been noted that Jesus spoke only twice about church, only twice, Matthew 16, Matthew 18. But he talked about discipling over 200 times. I think we can see what was more important to Jesus. If we try and build the church, we will end up with nothing. Because Jesus said that he would build his church. It's not our job. But if we focus on our commission, which is making disciples, will end up with a wonderful, vibrant church community. Now, like every great speaker, Paul knew, excuse me, I need a drink there. Paul knew that any teaching needs to have both helpful illustrations and practical applications. So verses three to six, he used three of his favorite illustrations, the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. So first the soldier, verses three to four. Paul often used military illustrations in his letters, which is not surprising. He lived in a military state. And in these verses, what Paul is doing is describing the characteristics of a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, soldiers, when they're on active service, they don't expect a safe or an easy time. They're not going to complain if they're put into battle. They expect hardship, risk, suffering. That's part and parcel of being a soldier. Similarly, the Christian should not expect an easy time. If we're loyal to Jesus and his commission to share the gospel, we're guaranteed to experience opposition and ridicule. The Greek word there you, we've got translated gets entangled is a picture of a soldier whose weapons have got caught up in his cloak. He's trying to get his sword out of the scabbard, but the cloak's got in the way and he can't fight. In other words, there's nothing intrinsically wrong about having civilian affairs unless they entangle us and disrupt our gospel mission. Remember, our primary purpose must be to please Jesus, our Lord, and not ourselves. Second, the athlete, verse 5. Here, the key phrase is, according to the rules. In the Olympic Games, there were strict rules which had to be obeyed. 
In fact, as far as I can tell, in no athletic contest before or since is an athlete given a sort of permission to do whatever they want, a random display of strength or speed or skill, and we're all going, well, what was that? And if you run or jump for fun as a hobby, that's great, but you're unlikely to win the prize. Like today, every sport in those days had its rules and its prize. And no athlete, however brilliant, was crowned unless they competed according to the rules. The order of the day was no rules, no victory wreath. So this illustra illustration reminds us of the absolute necessity for self-discipline. Now we looked at this, if you recall, in chapter 1, verse 7. Here there are two areas of discipline. The discipline of constant training and the discipline of the rule book. So if you're a serious athlete and you want to win, you cannot train just when you feel like it and you can't make up your own rules. So Paul is saying to Timothy, as he would say to us, the same to us today if he was here, the important thing is that you obey the word of God no matter what people may say. You're not running the race to please people or to get fame. You're running to please Jesus Christ. And you're aiming to cross the finish line of your life running. Third, the farmer, verse six. Now the key attribute of the farmer is hard work, blooming hard work. Hard work is indispensable to good farming. However poor the soil, inclement the weather, disinclined the farmer actually is, he's got to work. He's no choice if he's to reap a harvest and feed his family. This notion that Christian service is hard work is very unpopular in some Christian circles today. But it is toil and hard work, and we do get weary and tired. Unlike the soldier and the athlete, when you look at the farmer's life, it appears there's very little excitement there. There's a sort of glamour in the soldier's daring, and when he picks the crowd cheering the athlete, but if the farmer, it's hard work. And there's disappointments, but here's the key. The rewards are well worth it. And you know, the farmer gets to enjoy them first. Likewise, those who share the gospel are the first ones to enjoy its blessing. I know as a preacher, I always get more out of the sermon than I think. You guys, thank you for listening, but the hearers do, because I actually have to put that much more into it. So the dedication of a good soldier, the self-discipline of a good athlete, the painstaking labor of a good farmer. From the soldier, Timothy must learn endurance. From the athlete, discipline. And from the farmer, perseverance. Without endurance, discipline, and perseverance, we cannot expect transformation either in our own lives or in that of our society. Now, having illustrated his point, look at verse 7. Paul then tells Timothy to pause and reflect upon these truths and ask the Holy Spirit to give him insight. Now, this might sound really strange to all of you. I, I've got to admit to you, that I've, this is the verse I've struggled on all week. I, I just couldn't put my finger on why I've struggled on this verse, but it nagged me. I felt my spirit telling me that I was missing something important. My mind was telling me that there was something here that didn't make sense. I wrestled with this all week. And then it dawned on me. Now, if you've attended an Alpha course with me, you will know the triangle. Why? Because I teach it every time and then I nag you until you can teach it too. Beware if you're doing the course with me now. You're going to get nagged and nagged and nagged until you can do this. Timothy was Paul's companion and disciple for 16 years. He'd heard every illustration Paul used on numerous occasions. He would have been able to teach all about the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. He knew it backwards. So why is Paul telling him what he already knew? What exactly does Timothy need to reflect upon and be reminded about? Well, it's all about the F word. Yep, the, the four-letter F word that overshadowed the church and society 2,000 years ago and is doing exactly the same today. It's revealed starkly and all the more clearly with this pandemic and our response to it, both as a country and as individuals. And in case you haven't figured it out, the four-letter F word is fear. Fear. It dominates everything at the moment. Christians are called to be people of faith, not fear. So let's now remind ourselves of the situation. I said at the beginning of the talk, but hear it again. 
Paul is in prison and about to die because of his faith in Jesus and his proclamation of the gospel and the whole of the Bible. Because Paul is in prison, fear has stormed the church, especially the leaders who are associated with Paul. They are fearful. They're terrified that they will be imprisoned and lose their lives. And that is why everyone has deserted him. And Timothy is facing this fear. He's in fear of his freedom and of his very life. Will he continue to confess that Jesus is his Lord? Or will he, will he not? Will he, will, he, will he continue to proclaim the gospel? Or will he succumb to his fear? Will he choose self-preservation? Will he endure with Jesus? Or will he disown Jesus? That's really what's going on. Now, first to stand and then to move forward, Timothy will have to be strong in the face of these fears. That's why Paul began in verse 1 with those words, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The soldier has to overcome his fear or else he will never win the battle. He will run away. The athlete has to face his competitors in front of a crowd and run without fear if he has any chance of winning. The farmer has to faithfully plant crops regardless of the adverse weather and the conditions, the people saying that nothing can grow now. He has to do it to have any hope of a harvest. And this now makes sense of verse 8. Remember Christ Jesus, raised from the dead, descended from David. You see, it's not that Timothy was likely to forget Jesus. But the danger was that he would forget to believe the truths that he himself had taught and sung each week, the same danger that we face. You see, this evening during the service, we've sung great songs. Here are some of the words we sung, just to remind ourselves. Your grace is enough for me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Till all my fears are done. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. My fears were drowned in perfect love. Paul would challenge us as he challenged Timothy. Do you believe the words that you're singing? Because if you do, then your lives will witness to your belief. At this moment, the world is gripped with fear, specifically of this coronavirus. Our leaders are not Christians. Let's, let's just face that. And so their only alternative is to try and figure it out on their own without God's help. And people, they're not turning to the church for wisdom or leadership because we're not living any differently. From their perspective, our faith in Jesus is no help at this time of crisis. What is the root of the fear that is gripping the world? In a word, death. We don't want to die. And we're prepared to do and to give up practically anything to preserve our lives, including our freedoms. That was true of Jesus' disciples when he was arrested and crucified. In fear of their own lives, they ran away and denied him. But something happened to them which changed all that. They were transformed. They became courageous. They were willing to be imprisoned and to die. What happened? Well, two things, actually. First, they met the risen, resurrected Jesus. He rose from the dead, conquering fear. Now, death's grip of fear had been broken because eternal life was guaranteed. Remember Jesus Christ, says Paul, raised from the dead. Second, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Chapter 1, verse 7. We're going to celebrate this on the day of Pentecost in two weeks' time. Before Jesus came to earth, he reigned in heaven. Where there's no sickness, no coronavirus, no death, no fear, where the love of God is everywhere and perfect love drives out all fear. But when Jesus became a fully human being, here's the second part of the verse, descended from David, he intentionally contaminated himself with the fallenness of this world. He broke the social distancing. He touched the contagious leper. He was snitched upon as a result. The government heard and they immediately sought to lock Jesus up. He wasn't playing by their rule book. Incidentally, a rule book based on fear and punishment, not on faith, love, and grace. And finally, they had their way. On trumped-up charges, they imposed on Jesus what they feared the most, which is, you're right, death. So they killed Jesus. But our God is greater than death. 
He's the author of life and now he lives and reigns so that we too need no longer live paralyzed by fear, especially the fear of death. And that's why Paul goes on in verses 9 to 10 to encourage Timothy that although Paul himself is suffering, chained like a criminal, the gospel cannot be chained. It's the gospel that has the power to transform lives. We're called to be reliable witness of Jesus and this gospel, which alone can bring life, hope, and joy. And this explains why Paul included that verse at the end from a Christian hymn, verses 11 through 13. If we died with him. See, Paul's realistic. He's not shying away from this. We will also live with him. If we want to enjoy real life, eternal life, then we need to be prepared to die with Jesus. Over the centuries, Christians have been known for their courage. When a system had, uh, sorry, city had the plague and it was locked down with no resident allowed to leave. You know what happened? Christians chose to go into the city to minister to the sick, dying, bereaved, and fearful. Yes, many of those Christians then died of the plague, but many others were helped, and as a result, huge numbers were prepared to listen to the gospel because people who told it spoke of love, by love, and spoke because they'd earned the right to be listened. And then many, many chose to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord. Now, please do not misunderstand me. Am I suggesting we rebel against our government? No, not at the moment. Please don't mishear me. But I am saying that we must choose to believe our beliefs and not live under the fear of death, for that is no life at all. I mean, newsflash, we're all going to die inevitably. What happens, verse 12, if we disown Jesus? Like Peter, who denied Jesus because he feared for his life. I can't sugar the pill here. Jesus will disown us. What does that mean? It means that because we've chosen to live in fear rather than by faith in Jesus, we're no longer living by grace. We're no longer receiving the Father's love and his blessings. How can we move back into grace and love? Remember Jesus Christ. That's Paul's solution. Believe that he conquered death. Believe his promises and live them out, not just in theory, but in practice every day of your life. But what happens if we're faithless? And let's be realistic when we're faithless. This is not about losing our faith in Jesus, Lord. That's not up for grabs. Faithlessness happens when we choose not to live out our faith. Because of things like peer pressure or fear of death or imprisonment, fines, job loss, ridicule, you name it. Now, from the previous statements, we expect to read, if we are faithless, he will be faithless too. That's what it should read, isn't it? But Paul cannot say that. Instead, we read this glorious non sequitur. He will remain faithful because God is God and faithfulness is his middle name. You see, if God were to abandon us, even when we've been utterly faithless, he would not only be denying us, but most importantly, he would be denying himself. Our Lord is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping, faithful God. Rejoice with me. Divine grace may be theologically untidy, but it is gloriously true. We do not put our faith in our faith, or in our feelings, or in our leaders, because we will be faithless because our feelings will change and because our leaders will fail. We remember Jesus Christ and we put our faith in him alone. The great missionary Hudson Taylor often said, it's not by trying to be faithful, but in looking to the faithful one that we win the victory. Whether you've been faithful or fearful, whatever happened last week or last month is history. Today is Resurrection Day. We start a new week today with our faithful Lord Jesus. Ask the Father to fill you with the Holy Spirit for his power to endure, his love to drive out fear, and his self-discipline so that you are able to run the race of your life to the finish line. And follow Paul's advice in verse 1 and choose to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, that you do not deal with me as I deserve. 
when I have been faithless, fearful, and forgotten Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, you have always been faithful. I ask that you would increase my faith. Please give me your amazing grace, which I know will be more than sufficient for everything I will encounter this week. Please fill me with the Holy Spirit, with power, love, and self-discipline, and help me to be a reliable witness as I share the gospel with those around me, both with my words and by my faithful lifestyle. I ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm going to invite uh, Brenda and Chuck to share with us, both with scripture and in song, um, Psalm 25. Thanks, guys. Great to be with you. Thanks, Peter, for that really powerful message. It's great to be reminded that God has not given to us a spirit of fear. Psalm 25. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord, teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my savior. My hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All of the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. That's why my eyes are on you, oh Lord. 
surround me, defend me, oh how I need. To you I lift up my soul, to you I lift up my soul. Oh, no one whose hope is in you can put to shame. That's why my eyes are on you, oh Lord. Surround me, defend me, oh how I need. To you I lift up my soul, to you I lift up my soul. To you, oh Lord, I lift up my soul. To you, oh Lord, I lift up my soul. To you, oh Lord, I lift up my soul. Continuing on verse 11. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. Thank you, hey. Chuck and Brenda. Really good to see you guys. And um, it's very good to, to be able to sing along. It's amazing, this technology, isn't it, from across the country. Uh, we're going to do, have a time of confession based on that uh, particular psalm, um, that's Psalm 25. So uh, from that psalm, I'm going to pray a prayer, and then we're going to have a time of uh, silence as we do some business uh, with the Father. Father, I lift up my soul to you because I trust you. Even though I failed you on countless occasions, you have never left me and you've never forsaken me. I know I do not deserve your great mercy and love, but I gladly receive them both. And so friends, during a time of quiet, confess to the Father and ask him to forgive you. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, God says, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will remember your sins no more. Father, you always keep your promises. I believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid in full the price of all my sinfulness. For the sake of your reputation, forgive my iniquities, although they are great, and remember not my sins and my rebellious ways. Please fill me with the Holy Spirit. I pray that your integrity and righteousness would protect me. I invite you to instruct me and teach me your ways. I need you to help me keep my eyes on you and to guide me in your truth throughout this week so that I walk by faith and not by fear. I ask these things in the name of Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pete, for leading us into that time of confession, into doing business with the, the Lord. And I just encourage all of us to, to do it all the time. Do it every day. You can keep going back to the Lord and asking for forgiveness and guidance and um, just feels so good <laughs> to clean up. I'm just going to quickly go through some announcements. I have a couple. Adam has a couple. Um, I'm sure everyone's getting hungry for dinner, so I'll go quickly. The first one is, of course, thank you so much for your continued giving 
to light on the hill. Um, there are a couple of ways of doing that. You can drop something off, a check or money to Tammy or Adam at the church, or you can give online. That's giving at lightonthehill.ca. Um, there's also um, monthly giving with, uh, oh, I see it's all listed up there. So uh, thank you so much for your generous giving. And uh, we encourage you, if you are in a position to do so, to continue. Uh, the, the second announcement is with regards to the open cupboard. Uh, it is still available. There is still food available, um, dry goods, uh, frozen goods, fresh goods. Um, we had someone find out about us online this week and make use of that food as well as the usual people who make use of that food. So um, God is good and he's using your resources uh, to help his people. So bless you and thank you. Uh, just so you know what's happening there. And if you know someone else who is in need, uh, please uh, spread the word because it's there to share. Uh, the next thing is uh, community garden. Sorry, I lied. I had three uh, announcements. Community Garden is, uh, as we said last week, will be open on May 23rd. Uh, there still are. Adam, are there a couple of plots available, honey? Uh, yes, we have about eight left. Oh, fantastic. So if, if you are interested, um, just get in touch with Adam at the church and just know that there will be social distancing and uh, rules in place when, when the garden is open, but it's starting to look really beautiful. Thank you for uh, Peter Ebner is making all kinds of beautiful um, wooden uh, frames for all of the plots this year. They're gorgeous. Adam, to you, hon. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for bearing with us today. It's been quite a day uh, <laughs> for everybody. Uh, I just wanna say, uh, Chuck and Brenda, like, thanks so much. Like, so good to have you guys with us. I hope we can do this again. Come back, okay? In the next uh, couple of weeks. It's so much fun. Thanks for all the musicians. Thank you to all the people who read today. Thank you for all the people who prayed. Thank you to Paula. Thank you to Peter. Um, uh, a little bit of a tough day, but most of all, thank you to Stuart, who solved our problems today and figured us out. And got us going back. And Tammy for sending out all the information. I have got a couple of announcements. One is... Um, Brian Jerkson, who we all, I think I've got a spot like this. Brian uh, hosted with us a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I have set up a concert with Brian in a number of churches across Canada for next Friday evening. So 8 o'clock Eastern time, 5 o'clock Pacific time, Brian's going to be doing a 45-minute concert online. We'll send you out the information during the week. And he is... Uh, going to afterwards do a backstage with Brian, so it'll be about a 30 minute question and answer period with him. If you're a worship leader, so Chuck and uh, Matthew and Lily, and uh, I will send you out something this week. He's going to be doing a worship leader summit on Thursday afternoon at 2.15 our time. And you can hang out with Brian Dirksen for about 45 minutes. And uh, a bunch of people across Canada will be doing that and I'll send that information to you as we go on. And the only other announcement I have for you right now is that we did get our Canada Youth Grants. They're no longer the Canada Summer Job Grants, and this is for people who are between the ages of 16 and 30. You do not have to be going back to school. We got three grants for eight weeks. Two grants are starting the week after next. One of them is Community Gardens, one of them is Worship, and uh, Believe it or not, we were able to change it to a Zoom host. So uh, we will be able to have somebody doing worship with Zoom hosting and creative arts. And the third one is a general administrative and uh, ministry leader assistant. So if you're in between the ages of 16 and 30 and you are a Canadian citizen, we need to have your resume and a letter of interest by Wednesday of next week. If you need that information, it is on Facebook. And you can go to our Facebook page to do that. And it's also will be sent out, or has been sent out on MailChimp, or will be sent out. I've lost track. There's just too much communication going on this, at this point. So we will get uh, the rest of that information. But it does have to be in by Wednesday at 5 o'clock. Am I missing anything, Paula, Peter, Tammy? I think that's good, babe. Okay. So I'm going to invite James. James, would you mind leaving us with a blessing before we play uh, our final song sure, tonight? Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. Let's pray. Good Father, please be with us. 
and uh, to give us your faith in Jesus and uh, protect us and uh, make us know you well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, James. Uh, this last video is a technological uh, mystery to me. I don't understand how it works, but um, it's Lily and Jerry singing together, but apart. So I'm just going to leave you with this from Thessalonians. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Take it away, Lily and Jerry.
Thanks, everybody. Have a beautiful Sunday evening. And uh, just may the, the goodness and the light and the truth and the love that we all experienced together tonight permeate your hearts and your relationships and your conversations. And may it battle fear and give you hope. Amen? Amen. 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 Yay, God. Great service. If anybody wants to stay on, stay on. We'll leave it open. It's time Thank for you. dinner. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Thanks. everybody. Great job. Thank you. Bye, Lily. Thank you, Wonderful job. Awesome. Well done. Good job, Willie. See you, everybody. Good, Good night. Good night, guys. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thanks for putting up with me again. Love you. <laughs> oh. Our great pleasure. Bye-bye. I miss you guys so much. <laughs> okay, miss everybody. Great job, Adam. Hey, yeah. great job, Jerry. That's everybody involved. Everybody involved with the tech stuff. Great job. Wow. Great production, Jerry. Well done, man. Ready to do more. Be in touch. Okay. And that was just really good. Just want to clap everybody. That was super. Thanks for the perseverance today. Chuck, Jerry, Jerry, Chuck. We'll see you next week. Hey, not <laughs> back from Nick at three in the morning. <laughs> hey, three works for me, man. I just had the espresso going. Can we get the drums in, Martin? That's the only thing I need to add. You are. Yeah. Have a good one, guys. Good night. Can we get the drums in? I'm going to say good night, guys. Thank good night, you. Everyone. Good night. good night, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks, Adam. Well done, mate. Hold on, fast, Hassan. Hold on, fast. Hey, Stuart. Thanks so much, man. No worries. Anytime. We're really proud of you, Stuart. It's so grateful. I think I like and I'm, and I'm not normally the computer guy, so it's okay. <laughs> You've got that reputation now. Wow. Okay. Hey, Martin, happy belated birthday.